the monkeys that are born here, they're gonna die here. They have to live on this island together and there's nowhere for them to go. It's like a big social experiment. As you walk around down here, you're gonna see both cases of like true social love and also cases of terrible social nasty behaviors. Even though the island could be a paradise for them, in reality, they make their own hell. here my first day and I felt like it was this big mysterious Jurassic Park kind of place. It was just so bizarre and so exciting. So there was a thousand monkeys living on this island. This island is only for monkeys. There's actually nobody that lives on the island. A thousand macaques cut off from the rest of the world confined on a Caribbean island. Ever since their ancestors were brought here 75 years ago, they've been forced to live together in this space less than a mile across. The only other primates allowed on the island are scientists who come from the world over to study them. Most are interested in their social behavior and hope to find some clue about the roots of our own social interactions. How have these behaviors evolved? In what way has macaque social organization contributed to the success of their species? Jackie Boole is working on one of the many research projects on the island. Her job is to make note of 40 different social interactions. Whether it's a matter of benevolent or hostile behavior toward fellow monkeys, what processes determine the relations between one individual and another? Many scientists directing research on Kayo are asking the same question, but each has their own way of searching for answers. Michael Platt of Duke University is interested in how behavior is influenced by genes. Our goal here will be to see whether we can relate each individual animal's genes to the ways in which they interact with each other. Laurie Santos of Yale University is interested in how behavior is influenced by psychological processes. From a psychologist's perspective, my guess is that Somehow, once we wound up as a group living species, we had to build mechanisms to be nice to each other. It made sense for our individual survival to care about the group. And Dario Maestripieri of the University of Chicago is interested in how behavior is influenced by social structures. The main source of our problem has always been historically not, uh, not the physical environment, by other people. And it's the same for rhesus monkeys. These investigations benefit from the work of generations of scientists who have done research on the island of Cayo Santiago. Since its creation, this primate colony has served as a miniature society, a living social system whose mechanisms can be observed and analyzed. In 1938, Clarence Ray Carpenter, an American primatologist, frustrated of chasing monkeys through the jungle in order to study them, decided to create a more accessible but still free-ranging primate society. He collected 500 rhesus macaques in India, a majority of which were females, mostly pregnant, a few healthy males, and some young. Carpenter brought them across two oceans and released the 400 survivors halfway around the world on a tiny Caribbean island with no escape. 
The first images of the colony, filmed by Carpenter himself, are scarcely encouraging. Within two weeks of setting foot on the island, the macaques had killed most of the young. Then, forced to live together, they began to organize into different social groups. A colony was finally established. Carpenter witnessed the formation of a new world. His methodical observations initiated the practice of recording data on the life history and behavior of every monkey. His work helped establish an understanding of the fundamentals of macaque organization, an extremely hierarchical society in which domination defines the relationships between individuals, families, and groups. Today, the island's 1,200 macaques are organized into seven groups. Jackie Boole observes them up close eight hours a day for Michael Platt's genetic research. A group R, which is the second largest group on the island, they're known as being the more aggressive group. They, it seems to be a really high rate of aggression among all the individuals in that group. Group S, which is one of the smaller groups, some people call the hippie group. They seem to be the mellow, slightly more peaceful, not quite as much aggression, the peaceful group. The group that I study, Group F, is currently the biggest and the highest ranking of all the groups. So if they're walking along, then any other groups that are there, they're going to move out of the way. Group F which Jackie Boole follows, has dominated the island for 40 years. And the monkeys of Group F, like in all the other groups, are also organized according to a strict social hierarchy. So we're interested to know which animals are dominant, and there's different ways that you can tell this. There's something called a fear grimace, where it looks a little bit like a smile. And if they fear grimace, then that's going to be the lower-ranking animal in that interaction. Also, displacement. So if one animal comes along, sits down next to another animal, if that animal gets up and leaves, then the animal that leaves is going to be lower ranking than the one that came. In Group F, the highest ranking monkey is also the researcher's favorite. 85B. 85B nicknamed Chester, is renowned for his easygoing temperament and his surprising rise to the top. He's not the most attractive monkey. His head is a little bit squished. When he was younger, there was some terrible accident and he fell on his head and everybody thought he was going to die. And then he ended up becoming the highest ranking monkey on the island. Chester is the alpha male of group F, the dominant animal of the dominant group, and currently their uncontested leader. He is often accompanied by male number two, 36S. Kayo's other charismatic figure owes his reputation to very different reasons from Chester. 07D, nicknamed Tony after the notorious gangster in a Hollywood film, is considered the island's most aggressive monkey. Tony? Number three in the Group F hierarchy often attacks his fellow macaques for no apparent reason. The data collected by Jackie Bull is used to characterize each monkey in terms of its aggressiveness and sociability, its tendency to interact to a greater or lesser degree with others. When an animal starts grooming, we want to know who initiated the grooming, who's receiving the grooming, who's around those animals that are grooming, we want to know how long the grooming lasts, who ends that grooming bout. Grooming is one of the macaques' common social activities. This demonstration of cooperation allows the researchers to identify the individuals who are most active in the social network and those who are excluded from it. It also reveals the development of strategic alliances. Here, 
The female 00O, nicknamed U, after her particular tattooed ID, has been groomed by the same male for several weeks. An intimacy that could lead to mating in the future. Chester, the alpha male, has his coat groomed by a low-ranked female. While Tony, the challenger, enjoys the attentions of the alpha female, the matriarch, 14i. Now I can. We still have a couple pregnant females, but most Once of them a week, have their Jackie Bull shares the data she gathered on the island with Michael Platt. Thanks to this information, Lauren Brent can begin to profile each monkey of Group F. I think I have that. The easiest way to read social behavior data for me is to map it so that you can look at everyone's interactions with everyone else. So I can get a really full, complete picture of what's happening in this society. We can take, for example, all of the behaviors that we classify as aggressive, so biting, chasing, hitting, threatening, um, and we can construct a network from that. And we can take other behaviors that we consider to be uh, nice, affiliative behaviors, like grooming is the number one affiliative behavior in rhesus macaques. And from that, we can construct a different network. So the circles are the individuals, so you've got their names next to it. And then lines connecting individuals represents the fact that they interacted in an aggressive manner. So the rhesus macaques, so there are hundreds and hundreds of lines connecting everybody mostly. everybody fights with everybody in rhesus macaque society everyone fights with everyone however 07d alias tony is at the very center of the aggression network okay and then what do we have? um so this one is our grooming network the grooming map reveals important variations among individuals the alpha male, Chester, and the alpha female, 14i, are at the heart of the network. 36S, who ranks just below Chester, is also close to the center and exchanges a lot of grooming with his chief. In contrast, 07D, alias Tony, in spite of his high rank, is at the edge of the grooming network. This kind of confirms what we saw watching these monkeys sort of knowing them as individuals, anecdotally. Now we have the data to really show us, yes, this is actually what's going on. Chester's right in the middle of the grooming network. He's the popular guy, whereas O7D's maybe maybe Mr. Aggression, so he's right in the middle of the aggression network. The initial research results are in. Chester rose to the top through benevolent alliances. While Tony maintains his high status through aggression. Doesn't seem to be uh, in all in any way. While Michael Platt and Lauren Brent begin the long process of genetic analysis, the island's macaque community is about to conceive the next generation. In mating season, social relations intensify. Intercourse alternates with aggression, under the watchful eyes of researchers. There's generally quite a bit more aggression during uh, mating season. 07D, he's generally the most aggressive. Um, during mating season, he's the busiest male in Group F. He's constantly mating with different females. He definitely has a lot of babies running around with his genes in Group F. If high-ranking males seem to mate more than other males, it's because they're acting openly. But tucked away in the forest, 
some monkeys couple more discreetly. Nicknamed sneaky lovers, these pairs are animals from different groups, usually low-ranking, who must hide in order to avoid being caught. John Coyne, who's conducting a study on the practicalities of reproduction, observes their strategies. In general, females have a preference towards novel males. However, males that are in that group don't want more competition more than they already have, so they're very resistant to accept new males into a group. Ooh, a group F female, tries to lead a male from a different group away from prying eyes. If she's discovered, Ooh risks being attacked by males of her own group. Several young Group F members observe the couple's comings and goings. A male of Group F approaches the tree in which Ooh and the outsider have taken cover. Ooh departs immediately. The outsider spies the Group F male and heads off in the opposite direction. The male of group F follows O. But this censorious behavior, which the researchers call sex policing, fails to discourage the secret lovers. You would think that, you know, the males who mate a lot are going to have a lot more offspring than males who don't mate a lot, but when you do paternity tests, you realize it's not the case. So while the high ranking, highest ranking males may think that they're fathering all of the offspring in a group, that's definitely not what's actually occurring. Aggressive or benevolent, dominant or submissive, all types of individuals manage to reproduce. Nevertheless, genetic analysis reveals that the paternity record on the island belongs to Tony, father of more than 40 offspring. A record which he defends as head of the sex police. Later that same day, partially hidden by a ruined wall, Wu mates repeatedly with the same male she had long grooming sessions with the previous winter. Another couple is nearby, here in the foreground. In the background, Wu doesn't see danger coming. The female from the other couple moves off suddenly. Tony skirts the wall and leaps onto Wu, meeting out punishment. <laughs> does one macaque attack another with no apparent benefit? What thought processes lead one primate to comfort another in spite of danger? Lori Santos studies social relationships from the point of view of a psychologist. On Cayo Santiago, she's investigating the link between brain function and behavior. How the evolution of mental capacity in primates is reflected in how they behave towards each other. As a psychologist, what I'm interested in is how the monkeys think about other individuals. Do they know what's going on inside each other's heads? When they look at each other and see what they're looking at, do they know what others see? Do they know what they think? The way we actually study monkeys uh, is a little bit weird. In many of our studies, what we do is we set up these pretty strange experiments. 
kind of like a play. We let the monkeys actually watch humans interacting with each other. And the question is, what do they expect the humans to do? For nearly 20 years, Lori Santos has been engaging the monkeys in a variety of psychological tests in order to help her understand the brain functions at work in their social relationships. Such as the tendency to react differently when faced with a member of their own group or with an outsider. Watching fair or unfair sharing. or the capacity to understand what another individual knows or doesn't know, to surmise its intentions. We didn't used to think that monkeys could actually get inside each other's heads at all. We used to think that it was just humans that did that. Now we know from work here on Kaya that that's not correct. We know that the monkeys can think about what others know. So the process of really getting inside someone's head can be used for all kinds of different ends, right? Could be used for nasty ends. By the same token, the act of getting inside your head is really an important capacity for truly empathizing, truly being altruistic. For Lori Santos, the ability to understand what others are thinking is the foundation of complex social relationships. From the conception of Machiavellian strategies to the desire for justice among individuals. But in a highly competitive society like this one, why would a monkey use its mental faculties for the good of others? My guess is that the kind of care you see in Kayo, just you know, the standard things like moms looking after their infant, moms being very worried about their infant, you know, th this is the beginning of empathy that we see. You know, it makes total sense that natural selection would build in these kind of very caring, very kind of nice behaviors. Six months after mating season, a new generation of macaques is discovering life on Cayo Santiago, closely watched by their mothers. Once again this year, Ooh has no baby. She's sterile. Ooh is well known among the researchers for kidnapping. When she manages to snatch someone else's baby, U takes good care of it until the birth mother retrieves it. Here, X-83 is carrying her baby, which died last night. When an infant dies, Mothers sometimes won't part with the corpse until several days have passed and it has begun to decompose. I think for a long time folks have thought that evolution builds in selfish behavior. And I think this is a sort of new way that the field is going where folks are saying, actually this pro-social behavior, empathetic behavior, all of these kind of nice behaviors could really be selfish at the level of the gene, even though at the level of the mind, they involve these you know, incredibly empathetic sorts of behaviors. While natural selection relies on merciless competition, evoking selfish behaviors based on the defense of the individual's own interests, the survival of the species also depends upon the individual's ability to identify with others and help its descendants. The newborns who discover Monkey Island under the empathetic protection of their mothers 
will however quickly learn that this benevolence is selective. Among macaques, altruism and hostility combine according to unremitting rules. What are the social rules that prompt an individual to help another or instead to attack? This is what Dario Maestro Pieri is investigating in his research on Cayo. Is one of the reasons rhesus macaques are the most widespread primate species on Earth after humans due to their social system? Rhesus monkeys are pre-programmed essentially to fight for power. So it doesn't matter how much food there is or how nice the place is, they would behave just the same in every place of the world. Power in rhesus monkey societies depends on support from other individuals. They live in these large groups. They depend on other rhesus monkeys that could not survive by themselves. These groups have a, a matrilineal structure, which means that uh, females spend their entire lives in these groups. They never leave. Family members typically intervene in a fight and help their younger relatives. So the daughter of the alpha female learns that every time she gets into a fight, her mother will intervene to help her. And because of that, she will always win fights against all the others. And so that way she will learn that she's also high ranking. These two monkeys right here, this is 78T. She is the second highest ranking female in group F. Her mother is the alpha female. And the one that she's grooming is her son right there. Because he's from such a high ranking matcha line, he will pick on all sorts of other monkeys that you wouldn't think a male that age would pick on. Pretty brave, he knows that nobody's gonna mess with him because his family is so high ranking. They just <laughs> are threatening me, actually. <laughs> So she's a very, very aggressive female. <laughs> she's showing, showing off right now. <laughs> this mutual assistance between family members, which leads to the transmission of social rank from one generation to the next, defines what Dario Mastropieri calls a nepotistic society. Swiss monkeys provide a very good opportunity to study how nepotism works and what an important influence it has on life in a society. Nepotism is a universal phenomenon in nature. In all animal species, individuals tend to help their relatives at the expense of non-relatives. The solidarity between members of the same maternal line also establishes a strict hierarchy among the different families in the group. The offspring of lower-ranked females quickly learn their place in the pecking order. Here, a dominant female approaches the island's drinking station with her little one. Group members give way, deferring to her high status. She shoes away a dawdler. Then another low-ranked youngster approaches and drinks. The female notices. She grabs him by the neck and drags him to the sea, where she plunges his head underwater, teaching him a lesson he'll never forget. Through the aggression that they receive from others, they learn that if their mother is a low-status monkey, they learn that that's going to be their status as well. That's the way they learn. On Monkey Island, Competition plays out on several different levels, between individuals, families, and groups. In the island's hierarchy, the advantages of belonging to a powerful group, for instance belonging to group F, reside in the submission of other groups. Lori Santos observes a daily ritual which reveals the monkeys' allegiance to their own group. Every morning what happens is that the staff actually bring out some food for the monkeys. F would probably be waiting there 
and then you'd see the highest ranking guys in F heading in. The island's dominant group gets to eat first. Even though it's a big free-for-all, the monkeys know their place. So the high-ranking groups go in first, and as soon as the first bag is torn open, it's a big free-for-all. Everybody kind of runs in. And the whole time, lower-ranking groups are waiting outside, just waiting for their turn patiently. And this is incredible. I mean, these are hungry monkeys who are sitting there with their kids, just patiently waiting. It's really an impressive difference between the haves and the have-nots. And F is in the haves. Nonetheless, the inevitable encounters around the feeding station result in tensions. Several Group F monkeys chase away rivals from Group R. A Group R youngster takes advantage, entering the enclosure while it is still occupied by Group F. So if a juvenile individual who was from a low-ranking group tried to go in, he's going to get punished. Another adult who sees him is going to attack him. And then you see something even more incredible. As soon as one of their own is hurt, the low-ranking group is going to step up to the charge and try to fight back. Then all the differences within the group go away. It's us versus them. Everybody's on the front line. Moms with babies, low-ranking guys, everybody's defending the big group. Altruism, which creates solidarity between members of the same group, results in discrimination against outsiders. Two years after it began, Michael Platt and Lauren Brent are on the verge of completing their genetic study based on the social behavior of the monkeys on Cayo Santiago. So we've spent two years collecting behavioral data on monkeys in Group F. And then we spent also quite a lot of time genotyping these individuals. We had to get DNA from each one and work out their genotype for each individual in the lab. Now we've taken all of this very large amount of data and brought it all together. Um, and using statistical techniques, I've been able to map the monkey's social networks onto their genotype to see if there's a link between those two things. And what we've found is that there's potentially a link between grooming, the extent to which these monkeys in Group F are spending grooming in their social networks, how connected the individuals are, and their genotype. So certain individuals um, with certain serotonin genes seem to be more in the mix, they're more social, uh, they're more embedded in the social network, and other individuals with other serotonin genotypes uh, are more asocial, so they tend to not spend very much time grooming other individuals. These results reflect current scientific thinking. According to this perspective, behaviors of individuals depend upon their biology, their genes. Genes associated with behavior are passed from generation to generation according to the process of natural selection. Behaviors which promote the survival of the species are retained, while the less helpful ones are not. The sociability of rhesus macaques, which seems to be linked to genes for serotonin, would therefore be a fundamental trait in the species. Chester, who we knew was the alpha male, and we knew he was right in the middle of the grooming network. And he has serotonin genes that function very well. 
We know that if you're looking at this from an evolutionary perspective, there are very few individuals who have these very low-functioning genes. They're excluded. They're on the outskirts. So uh, it tells us that there's something very advantageous to have the very good functioning serotonin genes. What it doesn't tell us is why these bad functioning serotonin genes persist. And that's a really interesting question. High levels of sociability and hostility both persist among these monkeys. Is it because these two opposing attitudes are perfectly adapted to ensure their success? Both dispositions are clearly evident in males once they reach adolescence, when they leave their maternal group, entering the most dangerous stage of their lives. Dario Mastropieri's current research, carried out in the field by Sean Coyne, is focused on adolescent males trying to transfer from one group to another. Once a male reaches puberty, in his natal group he'll have a lot of female relatives, so the risk of inbreeding is pretty high. And so over evolutionary time, many mammals, not just primates, have evolved this strategy of immigrating into a new group so that they can reproduce without much risk of inbreeding. When they leave their birth group, males lose the protection of their family and their group. Without support, they must find a way to join a new group, whose males are hostile to accepting them. These two blonde brothers left their maternal family two years ago. Since then, they have lived on the periphery of Group V. Their efforts have been consistently rejected. When you try to enter into a new group, you can meet a lot of aggression from the members of that group. And so uh, you also run the risk of getting a fatal injury. In the wild, one third of males die transferring. Those which survive usually choose between an aggressive strategy, which consists in challenging the dominant members of the new group, and a more friendly one, which consists in socializing with the more accommodating ones. Here, one of the blonde brothers manages to attract a female from Group V. He hopes to gain her confidence and lure her away into the bushes. If you can get a female support, then you'll not only have her support, but if she's supporting you, then her whole family, all of her sisters and aunts and mom and all of them will also support you. So if you can really form a bond in that group, you'll have a larger social base. Mating is definitely a strategy to help try to integrate yourself into a new group. Eventually, the female follows the transferring male. One of the blonde brothers finally socializes with a member of Group V, after several months of effort. That's an important step in his integration. This strategy of making alliances is precisely what allowed Chester to climb to the top of the island's hierarchy in spite of his difficult start in life. Laurie Santos recalls the rise through the ranks of Chester, 85B. When I first started coming on the island as an undergrad, he was a, a young kid and we got to know him in part because he fell on his head. But it didn't really affect him, like he still would go around and play and he didn't seem to realize that he looked weird and his head was kind of crooked. And then it was neat to see him actually think about transferring, kind of like the Golden Brothers who are transferring now. So I would come eat lunch out here on the Isthmus just by myself and I'd have a sandwich from the Panadria. But 85B, because he was this kind of pathetic peripheral male, would come eat too. And so we would both sit and eat on the isthmus and like, I didn't have anybody to talk to, so he kind of like became my friend. Um, I'm not sure it was, the feelings were mutual, but I sort of enjoyed like, oh, he's there again, that weird guy with the weird head. So I have a certain amount of pride that he ended up moving up the ranks and eventually becoming the head of the biggest you know, group on the island. Like he almost died when he was like a toddler and now he rose to the top. But Chester's destiny is about to turn. Revolutions in the established order are rare, 
and Chester, the alpha male of Group F, for two years, has created a solid network among the dominant females. But for the last few weeks, the monkeys in Group F have been spreading out. A sign of instability. Something that doesn't bode well. So I was collecting behavioral data when I heard a lot of monkey noise, and so I went to go see what was going on. At first I was just enthralled, and I didn't quite know what to do. I always carry my phone with me, and I started filming. At first it was hard to tell who was fighting against who, but actually it turned out that one of the groups was split in half, and they were fighting against each other. Usually when there's a fight, it lasts 30 seconds and then it stops and they go back to eating or grooming. But this, it just kept going on and on and on. So at one point, one side sort of mobs one particular individual, and there's this huge group of monkeys surrounding him, attacking him. They just seemed much more unpredictable than what I was used to. So I sort of backed off a little bit because I didn't know what those monkeys were going to do. event has just taken place. Group F, Lauren Brent's study group, has just split. And the matriarch, 14I, has been excluded from the group. We knew something weird was happening for a few months because they'd been ranging much more widely than they had before. But I had to see for myself that it had happened once it had happened because I still didn't want to believe that the group had split. Lauren Brent searches for 14I and finds her, wounded and alone on the beach. She was ranging by herself, sort of wandering around with no other monkeys. She had a big cut on her head. I followed her around and filmed her a little bit. At one point I saw her meet Group F, and what happened is as the group approached, she sat there for a few minutes, but I didn't even notice any individuals in Group F take much note of her. So this used to be their alpha female. This used to be the female that all the other females had to submit to and bow to and get out of the way. And here she is watching them go to eat and she leaves and they don't even pay any attention to her. I just knew that basically she wasn't gonna make it and it was really hard. Fourteen I, the matriarch, dies a few days later. An urgent meeting has been called by the Primate Research Center. The whole dominant maternal line, the matriarch's daughters and granddaughters, has been chased out of the group. And two weeks later, Chester, the alpha male, the benevolent leader, is found dead. Within the span of two weeks, both our alpha female and our alpha male died. That is just chaos. Which is good, because I really want to know what happened. The necropsies of Chester and the matriarch reveal that the two Group F leaders died of injuries inflicted by one or more of their fellow monkeys. Because, I mean, since you guys think that O7D is alpha now, Chester died of fatal injuries. 
The researchers suspect the group's former number three, Tony. Since Chester's death, Tony, 07D, has been spotted at a distance from the main group, leading some 20 monkeys. 07D is extra aggressive, so he's really an aggressive monkey. He always uh, bites, chases the females, which is very much different from Chester. Chester just, he's a chill leader. You know, he just sits and then everyone grooms him. I think nobody wanted to tell me when he, he passed away. Here's the way I like to remember 85B, that's him there. And this is like all the ladies uh, that he's hanging out with. Whether it's a matter of analyzing a genetic profile which would dispose a macaque to sociability, the cerebral capacity that would allow a monkey to understand another's point of view, or social rules which are passed from generation to generation, these scientists conceive of social relations from the very long-term perspective of evolution. But what about a more recent story? One that began a few million years ago, when the paths of human beings and other primates went their separate ways. It's very tempting to make a very direct link between what we observe in rhesus macaques and what we see in people. In fact, there's probably some reason to do so. If you think about it, if you look at the brain of a rhesus macaque and you look at the brain of a human, really what you're seeing is that we are working with a 30 million year old device. This computing mechanism between our ears has expanded greatly, but it contains all the same circuits that you find in a rhesus macaque. It's very challenging looking at these, these questions uh, in terms of what is uh, uniquely human and our ability to regulate our kind of basis, basal instincts. But I think that that capacity is there. And one of the things that's really um, intriguing about the last decade of neuroscience is that we've begun to reveal some of the actual biological mechanisms that seem to help us to regulate are more basal tendencies. These mechanisms, which allow human beings to regulate their more basal tendencies, are not studied on Cayo. That's because if such regulators exist on Monkey Island, they're still highly primitive. Two weeks after Chester's death, Tony and his followers rejoin Group F. The top place in the group would logically belong to the former number two, Chester's companion, but Tony forces him into exile. Tony, the most aggressive male, has seized control of the island. After two years spent in the company of monkeys, Jackie Bull is getting ready to leave Cayo Santiago for good. I'll miss them and I'm pretty sure they won't miss me when I'm gone. I spend eight hours a day with the monkeys and I've definitely spent more time with monkeys the last two years than humans. And so just some of the like nicer things, just having a slightly more normal life and different set of concerns.
The observation of our ancient primate relatives encourages us to reflect on the tension in our own social relations between behaviors inherited over the long course of evolution and a more recent development which tries to overcome them. There's a difference between uh, explaining something as being natural and saying this is the right way to behave. Biology is not destiny. It doesn't say, oh, because your behavior has evolved, this is your destiny, this is the way you should behave in the future. No, you can change it if you want. Many of the, the mechanisms we have to think about the world, all the, our psychological traits, are there because of natural selection. The one thing that's weird about humans is that we can think about natural selection. We're the first ones that can take the evolutionary process and understand it. I think ultimately that's the difference between the humans and the monkeys. We're out here thinking about their negative behavior. They're not studying our negative behaviors, and we can use what we understand to make societies more altruistic places. Yeah.